Good evening. Yeah, I hear it too. So please have a seat. I pray for the children's wing <laughs> without a roof. <clears throat> Let's turn in our Bibles this evening to uh, Acts chapter 9. Sunday night through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, and we pick things up um, in chapter 9. We left off in verse 31 at the conclusion of uh, Paul's uh, early testimony, him heading then to the city of Tarsus, his uh, hometown, in order to spend this next 10 years being prepared by God for all of the great things that were going to happen through his life that we get to in uh, chapter uh, uh, 11. And, uh, but here we move and shifts at this point in verse 32 to the ministry of the Apostle Peter. And it came to pass as Peter went through all parts of the country uh, that he also came down to the saints who dwelt in uh, Lydda. And so uh, Lydda, city of Lydda was known in Old Testament times as Lod. If you've ever been to Israel or you ever do go to Israel, and uh, you have the guide on the bus, and all the way through the journeys, they will mention all of these biblical names, and it's over here on your left and over here on your right. And uh, as you're endeavoring to leave uh, Ben Gurion International Airport, the first biblical site you will be leaving is the ancient city of Lod. Uh, the uh, airport was built upon uh, that, that ancient city uh, right in that area. And so this is where he is. Uh, this is up uh, north a little bit of, of Tel Aviv, gives us a sense for where he is uh, in the land of Israel. And uh, you notice the word saints are used there. Uh, in verse 32, he came down to the saints who were d dwelt in, uh, in Lydda. And, uh, and here you have Christians being called uh, saints for the first time here. I, I believe, in uh, the book of, uh, of Acts. And so there were Christians in Lydda at this time, probably as a result of Philip's ministry. We just left off with Philip. Philip the evangelist who goes out and a part of that revival that happened among the Samaritans in Samaria. Then he goes to the Ethiopian eunuch. The Lord takes him up uh, away from the Ethiopian eunuch and takes him over to uh, uh, Ashdod in the southern coastline of Israel, and then he makes his way up uh, to the area of Caesarea. And so this would have been part of the region that he would have evangelized as a part of his ministry. Remember, the book of Acts covers a period of about 30 years. And so there can be these great time gaps that uh, exist where these things have happened. And probably the Christians he's running into there are a part of uh, Philip's uh, ministry. And so uh, he came into Lydda and he found a certain man named uh, Aeneas. And uh, uh, he is a Christian. He, is, uh, he came to the saints, Peter did, and this is one of the saints, and uh, who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. So I wouldn't want to be in any single position uh, for an hour. Uh, let alone being in a single position uh, because I'm paralyzed. I mean, you think if you've ever had anybody in hospice or anybody that's been in the hospital for an extended period of time and uh, the great uh, fight and battle that goes on with uh, bed sores, the great danger and infection that is to a person. And so uh, here in ancient times, what a, a difficult uh, place to be in. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise, make up your bed. And then he rose immediately. I bet he did. <laughs> I mean, that must have been something uh, to be right there and to experience that power. And so all who dwelt at Lydda and Sharon saw him and they turned to the Lord. And so this great uh, demonstration of God's power among God's people. And uh, of course, uh, uh, this gets noticed by the community. This guy is uh, 
one day, you, for eight years, you've been hearing about him being in a, a bed paralyzed, and uh, the next morning you see him at high hop uh, having uh, pancakes. And so what in the world happened here? And the word goes out at the, the name of Jesus that he had been uh, healed. And so in confirming the word with accompanying signs and wonders. And then Peter made his way uh, from uh, Lod, and he made his way to Joppa, verse 36. At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha. So she is a, a, a Christian. The city of Joppa is about 30 miles south of Tel Aviv, beautiful coastal city. We always spend the last day of a trip to Israel uh, in the city of Joppa. Everybody loves being there biblical significance of it and all, but a, a beautiful, uh, beautiful setting. Now it's an artistic uh, community and so fun to see what uh, everybody is up to. And so he comes then to that city and uh, there's this woman, uh, her name is Tabitha, which is translated uh, Dorcas. And uh, this woman was full of good works and charitable deeds which she did. So she's a Christian. She's doing good to all, all kinds of people and, um, and specifically in the realm of sewing, in the realm of uh, repairing clothing, making clothing for uh, widows in the community and those that are in need. And it happened in those days that she became sick uh, and she died. And when they had washed her, that is her body, uh, and they laid her in an upper room and, uh, and, and uh, laid her body there to await then uh, burial. So this was a standard in the uh, ancient world, certainly among the Jews was typically, uh, that was the only preparation for a body. The body would be washed and cleansed and then final respects be paid. And, uh, and then the body would, body would typically be buried that day. Now, because this is outside of uh, the vicinity of uh, Jerusalem, uh, there's a, 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 there might not have been the kind of adherence, and clearly there wasn't in this situation for the bearing on the same day because time is going to be required to go and get Peter and, and the miracle uh, that follows here. So she, she dies, she's prepared uh, for uh, burial, and, uh, and we're told that uh, since Lydda was near Joppa, uh, the disciples had heard that Peter was there, probably heard about the miracle that had happened there. So they sent two men up to him, imploring him not to de delay in coming uh, to them. So they, have, they know Peter is up there. They uh, have probably heard that Aeneas has been uh, healed and God is working through the apostle in this way. They may want Peter to come uh, in order to uh, heal uh, Dorcas, or maybe they just wanted to have uh, someone with his kind of prominence to oversee um, her memorial service. We're not really told. Peter receives the request, and he arose, and he went with them. And when they had come into the city uh, uh, there, uh, they brought him in Joppa to uh, the upper room where her body was. And then all of the widows, these are the, these are the poorest and most vulnerable in the ancient culture still today around the world. Uh, and, and so uh, they stood by him weeping as he enters the room. They clearly have uh, crowded in and filled this room about, around Dorcas, uh, lamenting the loss of this a Christian woman who had impacted them, and they showed uh, the tunics and the garments which Dorcas had made uh, while she was with uh, them. And so uh, this is the, the scene that uh, Peter walks into, and Peter then put everybody out of the room, and he knelt down and he prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise and she opened her eyes and when she saw Peter she sat up and then the gentleman that Peter was he then gave her his hand lifted her up 
uh, out of the seated position and uh, to stand. And when uh, he had called the saints and the widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all of Joppa, and many believed on the Lord, so, that, uh, so it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon uh, the Tanner. And so uh, we notice in Joppa this, the, the dramatic uh, impact of Dorcas's uh, life upon that entire uh, community, how well uh, uh, known she had become. When we saw Stephen, Stephen was a deacon, and a Bible teacher, and, uh, and so when he, he died uh, as a result of his stoning, there was a great lamenting. Again, we looked at the fact, live uh, so as to be missed when you're gone. And not only missed when you're gone, but to be missed by the devout when you're gone. And so Stephen did that in operating as a deacon, God's call upon his life, as a preacher and as a Bible teacher, and yet here you see uh, a woman with an entirely different calling and an entirely a different uh, gifting, a gift of helps, and, and she has lived her life so as to be missed and to be missed uh, by the devout when she's gone. And, and how did she do it? She did it by the needle. And it's the power of the needle. And, and so it, 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 some people would be terrified at getting up and preaching or being given the authority over the daily distribution between the Grecian and Hebrew Jews and all of that. But they can do this. And, uh, and that uh, helping people uh, 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 impacted the entire uh, community. Just these little... Uh, acts of kindness. And when you help people, when we help people um, in their moment of vulnerability, uh, they never forget it. This is why those of you who are in the medical profession, and especially in the hospitals and the ERs and that, that kind of thing, where I don't care who a person is, when you go in there, all dignity is gone and you're typically so sick, you can't put on any kind of professional airs. You are at the mercy of whoever is taking care of you. And I'm always astonished at the quality of not only medical care, but the quality of attitude of people in, in that field. And then when somebody does something uh, kind for you, um, you never forget it. I'll never forget a time in my life when I, um, I was on an international flight and I forget where I was going, and I've had probably six migraine headaches in my life. And I got a migraine headache on that flight, and, uh, and it was just crushing me. And I had nothing with which to uh, deal with it on me. And, uh, and then this flight attendant, uh, he came and he said, what's going on, you know, and that kind of a deal. And, uh, and then he had, he had some powerful stuff uh, to give to me, all legal. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he gave it to me, and then he moved me up to business class so I could lean back. So I've used that on every flight I've been on ever <laughs> since, but I really haven't. But, but you never forget that moment when somebody helps you and then especially for us as Christians, because, of course, we're wanting to represent ourselves, but to represent the Lord as well. And she certainly understood uh, the power uh, of, of those things, and she lived her life in such a way uh, as to, uh, to be missed. And then we shift over, and we see here in verse 43, we, we don't want to miss this, um, that uh, Simon, the uh, apostle uh, Peter, having come to Joppa, he stays down in Joppa with a man by the name of Simon. So now we've got two Simons. And uh, Simon was a tanner. Now, a tanner is somebody who deals with uh, the dead bodies and the carcasses, the skins uh, of de dead animals. And under the law of Moses, that would make you ceremonially unclean. And so here we see Peter, the apostle, 
who uh, is by degrees understanding the implications of the new covenant that we're no longer under the law and the ceremonial law of, uh, of, uh, of the law of Moses. And he's come some distance before God is really going to hit the Grand Slam home run with him in this passage uh, and, and bring down most of the walls in his life uh, that he, he carried into the Gentile world with his, uh, as a Jew and based upon the Jewish traditions. And, and here his willingness to stay in the home of a tanner. Now there was a certain man in Caesarea named, uh, called Cornelius, and he was a centurion of what is called uh, the Italian regiment. And so uh, the centurion was a Roman officer. We would, he would typically be uh, kind of a, um, a, a little bit, well, quite a bit, a hybrid, but the closest thing in our military would be a sergeant over a unit. And so he was in charge of a, a unit of a hundred soldiers, and uh, the uh, the centurions were the backbone of the Roman army. It held together in its discipline, it was prepared in its training. These the the, the Roman army uh, did what it did because of its centurions. And so this is a a remarkable man. It's a battle-seasoned man, uh, a, a tough guy. Not in a tough guy way where you wear it on your uh, on your shoulder or anything like that. But uh, this is no, uh, you know, a baby here. And every time a, a centurion is represented in the scriptures, he is always uh, represented in a, in a commendable light. And Cornelius certainly leads the way. Uh, in that. The description continues, he was a devout man. In other words, he was, he was drop dead serious about God. Um, God and the existence of God and, and knowing God and seeking God uh, was not a game for him. This was serious business to him. And he was one who feared God, possessed a tremendous reverence for God, and, uh, and he was a man who taught that reverence and respect for God uh, to his entire household. So uh, he, he is probably very likely what the Jews would have called in those days a God-fearer. Um, there were so many ancient uh, Roman gods in those days. We talked a little bit about it this morning. And, uh, and so much uh, representatives of the flesh, the practices that were practiced uh, in the worship of these uh, idols. Uh, and it wasn't unusual for someone, a Gentile, with a sincere seeking after God uh, to reject these Roman gods. And uh, the God of the Bible, the God of the Jews, appealed to them because there was just one God uh, to seek, uh, and, and Judaism uh, was and is one of the three monotheistic religions in the world with Islam and Christianity, but there was only one God uh, to try and please and to try and obey rather than all of these different uh, gods. And so anyone that was really serious about that, uh, these things, seeking after God, knowing God, what is He like, would then turn to Judaism in order to, uh, and then be exposed to this God of the Bible. Now, a, a proselyte or a Gentile convert into Judaism would have required uh, that a Gentile be circumcised, uh, keep a, a strict adherence of uh, the uh, Sabbath law, and also uh, bring forth the sacrifices. And clearly Cornelius is not in that kind of a category. And so there was this group called the God-fears. And so they would attend synagogue. Uh, they would worship the God of the Jews, the God of the Bible. But they didn't take this, uh, this extra step. And clearly he's in this category. He gave alms generously to the people, uh, generous with his money and helping people. And he prayed to God uh, always. And so he was a man, a man of prayer, lifting up his prayers uh, uh, to, 
uh, to the people. And so with this listing of him, and uh, he cared about people, a man of prayer, and just an extraordinary um, list here of, of uh, what this man was like, a, a genuinely remarkable man. You read, the des- you read the description, and you might think to yourself that, that 90% of the world don't live up to the standard at which this man uh, lived his life as a Roman centurion and as a, a seeker after God. And I think a, e- easily uh, a Christian could well look at this list of, of him and, uh, and uh, declare, wow, he's, his life could put many Christians to shame. And of course it could. Realize that this detailed description that is given to us um, is not... Um, just merely to provide it to us, but it's provided to us for a purpose. And what it communicates to us is that even though Cornelius was all of those things, he still wasn't saved. He still needed to be saved. He still needed to come into contact with the gospel and put his faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And so he is the, one of the great portraits in the Bible of the good man who is nonetheless in uh, need of salvation yet and, and the forgiveness of uh, sins. And God is going to take care of this, uh, uh, this situation in his life uh, now. About the ninth hour of the day, that's three in the afternoon, the way the Jews measured time, Uh, Cornelius saw clearly in a vision uh, an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed this angel, he was afraid. Uh, It takes a little bit to make a Roman centurion afraid. Sometimes people say, God, if you're real, then show me an angel. Well, um, when's the last time you had an EKG? Just to make sure that you're ready for that experience. So he was afraid, and, uh, and uh, he knew somebody was on the scene that outranked him because he said, uh, what is it, Lord? And the angel said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up uh, uh, for a memorial before uh, God. And so uh, here is Cornelius. He's been uh, praying to the Lord, and the, and the angel informs him, uh, God has been hearing your prayers, and, and these alms that you give, you know, on, on God's behalf, so to speak, somehow associated with God, it, it's come as a memorial. God has noticed these things. Now, sometimes you'll hear, sometimes you'll hear that uh, God never hears the prayers of the unsaved, and that, that wouldn't be true. We see that uh, here is a prayer uh, that even before Cornelius is saved, God has heard his uh, prayers. So God uh, hears the prayers of, of seekers who are looking to please him. Now, it's another thing if a person is not a Christian, has rejected Christ and says, I will come to God on my own terms and in my own righteousness and I will pray to him and he will listen to me. Uh, That prayer may not make it out of the room. Uh, This is an entirely different kind of of situation uh, here. So this angel comes to Cornelius and I think we see a very important truth about God on full display in Cornelius. And that is, if a person is obedient to the light that they possess, the spiritual light that they possess in life, then God will meet him there or her and, and bring them into an exposure to Christ. And, and it's his responsibility to do so, and he does it. And so Cornelius lived up to the light that he had. Uh, and so you say, what light did he have? Well, the light of creation. Uh, All of the creation that we live in the context of every single day, all of that creation speaks of a creator. And since the creator is always greater than his creation, who is the one that created this and is greater than the creation? So the recognition that there's a creator. 
then you look at all of the creation and you look at the marvel of the design, the interconnectedness of the creation, and we realize to any thinking person or takes a moment to think about it, looks at it and says, look at this marvelous design that is here, and part of living up to the light that God has given to every human being uh, in the world is to realize there must be a designer behind all of this design. And he is greater than what he has created and what he has uh, designed. There is someone who brought all of this into existence and designed it. And then there is the witness of conscience in every single human being. Romans chapter one, Romans chapter two. Each and every person in the world has this innate, Uh, built within us at birth, given to us by God as a part of being created in the image of God, a a intuitive uh, sense of right and wrong, and, and the knowledge of certain things always being right, certain things always being wrong, and universal in the world across all of the differences of mankind, Uh, around the world. Murder is always wrong. Theft is always wrong. Sexual abuse is always wrong. Doing good is always right. These are things that we recognize and agree upon as being right and wrong solely because we possess a conscience that God has given to us. And, and, And so there is that conscience that we have. And the interesting thing about our conscience is Our conscience, the standard of our conscience, is higher than our practice. And so it must mean that it doesn't have its origin in us. That it's been given to us by someone greater uh, than, uh, than us. And then there is the revelation of the Scriptures. For Cornelius, it would be the light of the Old Testament Scriptures, which clearly, as we're going to see in a moment, he understood and he was growing in. And I think that very often you'll hear people say, and, and, and more often than not, well, almost universally, you will uh, in, in, an, in an attempt to build a fire under us as Christians through the use of uh, guilt or condemnation, at least that's how I view it. Uh, people will look and say, well, you know, the world is in the sinful, wicked, uh, Christ rebellion, co- re- uh, 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 rebellious against uh, Christ condition that it is in because Christians have failed to take the gospel into the world uh, as we should. Now, we should always take the gospel into the world. That's a great commission. But it is way more nuanced and complicated than that. The other end of the spectrum is every single human being in this world and in this city has a responsibility somewhere in the course of their three score and ten to live up to the light that has been given to us in creation. To give some thought to that. How did it get here? Who would be able to do this? To give some thought to the marvel of design in creation. The marvel of a conscience. Every single human being in the world has the responsibility, if they have access to it, to read the Bible and then come to a conclusion about the God of the Bible and what He calls mankind to, the needs of mankind as He defines them, and His provision for it, and to investigate the claims of of the God who declares Himself to be both the Creator and the Designer. And so this idea that someday... um, a person is going to be able to go uh, all the way through life playing video games and binge watching on Netflix and eating one meal after another 
and, and engaging in one pleasure after another and then stand before God one day and lay all of the blame on Christians or upon God, that is, that is a culture that is completely ignorant of its responsibility to live up to the light that we all have. And when we do, when we grapple with those questions, who made this, who designed this, who made me, and who made human beings by virtue of conscience greater than the animal kingdom, who wrote that Bible? And then when those questions are taken seriously in a human life and they are searched out, God takes the responsibility then to step in and say, I will bring you into contact with my son and into salvation. And that's what he does with Cornelius uh, right here. And, and uh, uh, that the, the importance of both sides of, of this thing. And Cornelius was a man, a thinking man, a serious man about life. And, and he took those steps. Sometimes people will uh, reject Christianity as kind of an excuse to, with a wave of the hand. What about the pygmies? What about those pygmies? They never heard the gospel, and, they, and, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and so they die without hearing the gospel. And what about the pygmies? Is God going to judge them and send them to hell? You know? Well, you'll be relieved to know the pygmies were reached for the gospel a long, long time ago. But concerning the what about the pygmies question, one of the disciples came, uh, 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 came to, to Jesus, the disciples did as a whole, and they said, um, and, and they asked about, well, how many will be saved? How many are going to be saved in this world? And what about the pygmies? And, and Jesus said, you enter the straight gate. Don't you worry about the pygmies. You worry about yourself. You get saved. You walk through that gate of salvation. Take your place in the Great Commission. I'll take care of the pygmies. And one day the Bible says in the book of Revelation, when we are one day in heaven and we are praising the Lord up there, one of the choruses that we will sing to him is, Righteous and true are your judgments. When we see how God handles every single person in history, every single thing in history, we will just look at it and go, that is so righteous and so true in terms of how uh, he has handled that, and we will praise him for that. But the cultures of the world, including this materialistic uh, uh, entertainment, distraction-driven uh, uh, culture, uh, we still have the responsibility to live up to the light that we have. And there is a lot of light in this country, and, and that responsibility lies on us. When we will do that, uh, God will meet with us even as he meets with uh, Cornelius uh, here. And so uh, uh, the angel instructed uh, Cornelius, now send men to Joppa, about 30 miles down the coast, and uh, send uh, for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He's lodging with Simon, a tanner whose house is by the sea, and he will tell you what you must do. All right. So there's something more to all of this in terms of a relationship with God than what Cornelius has experienced, but he doesn't know it. And, and to know it for him, he's going to do it. And so Peter's going to bring that news to him. And then the angel who spoke with him when he had departed, Cornelius waited two weeks, and then he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. Now he got right on it. They were in Joppa the next day, by noon. <laughs> I mean, this is a guy that is, is, you know, hungry for the things of God. And so when he had explained all of these things, the vision that he had had, Cornelius then sent them to Joppa to get Peter. Now the next day, as they uh, went on their journey and they drew uh, near to the city of Joppa, Peter went up on the housetop to pray 
uh, about the sixth hour. So the sixth hour is noon, it's lunchtime, and, uh, and realize that many of the houses in, in the ancient world, most of them were flat-topped uh, uh, roofs, and so you could go up there to pray. It was like an additional living area. And if you lived on a seaport like uh, Joppa, you would probably spend a lot of time up on the roof uh, looking out on, on that, that beautiful scene. And so he goes up there, and he went up to pray, and then he became very hungry, uh, and he wanted to eat. But while they were making ready uh, the lunch, he fell into a trance, and he saw heaven opened, and an object like a great sheet bound uh, at the four corners, descending to him, and let down to the earth. And so you picture this, so prob- and very often on those rooftops they would have like a uh, a, a canvas or some whatever the material would be, a covering for uh, a shade and all. And so he goes into this, this trance, this uh, vision. He sees this great sheet coming down, and in that sheet were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and the birds of the air. And so he sees all kinds of animals, clean and unclean animals, according to the law uh, of Moses. And then a voice came to Peter and said, Rise, Peter, kill and uh, eat. And so, uh, in other words, kill the animals and prepare uh, a meal from, uh, from them. And Peter protested. He said, not so, Lord. Uh, two very inconsistent <laughs> phrases. You can say, uh, yes, Lord, or you can say, no, uh, but you can't say, not so, Lord. And that's what he does here. For I have never eaten anything common or unclean. I'm a kosher Jew. I have never ever eaten an unclean animal according to the law of Moses. And uh, uh, I, I can't do this. And then the voice spoke to him again a second time and said, what God has cleansed, you must not call uh, common. And that word you is emphatic in, uh, in the original language, and it's declaring something like, if I declare something to be acceptable, uh, then it is acceptable. And so uh, this, uh, uh, this vision that he received, and the vision isn't supremely about uh, Jewish dietary laws at all, but it was intended to prepare Peter's heart for the messengers who were coming uh, from Cornelius' house to invite Peter to to Cornelius' house. And Peter had about the same uh, view at this point of Gentiles as he had of eating an unclean animal. It was in a very high uh, view, uh, though, though an apostle. And so uh, this is about how Peter is no longer to view uh, uh, human beings or the Gentiles the way uh, that he once did, but now as as God did that uh, does all that all people Jew and Gentile alike have the same standing uh, before God as it relates to salvation, and so uh, that Gentiles like Cornelius were acceptable to God in in uh, uh, coming into His kingdom, and we look at this and go ah. Uh, hello, (laughs) but I would guess to say we're almost 100% Gentile uh, in the room tonight, so we just take it for granted. We don't have the hurdles that the apostle had uh, to get over, and uh, and the difficulties, the great hostility and animosity between the Jews and the Gentiles in those days, and especially the scene that Peter's going to be brought into in just a day or so, and that is into the home of a Roman centurion. Not only is he a Gentile, but he is a Gentile who is an officer in the occupying force within the land. And uh, and the, the Gentile history toward the Jews, even at that point, was not a good history of Gentiles treating Jews uh, well. And and so 
Peter had a lot uh, to work through here, and the Lord is working him through that. So he gives this vision to, uh, to Cornelius, and then how the Lord does, he works both ends of it. He comes over, works the other end of it by speaking to Peter. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. Peter has quite a relationship with threes, doesn't he? He denied uh, the Lord three times, and, and uh, uh, he, uh, he had, at his restoration, had to confess that he loved the Lord uh, three times. Here is this same vision uh, three times. God is going to drive, uh, I don't know, say this authoritatively or, or even remotely uh, that, but um, I certainly don't look at, uh, down on Peter for this. Um, I don't know how many times I need to hear something from God before I get it. So he knows us, and how many times he's got to do something to get through to us. And so three times, and while Peter wondered within himself what uh, this vision which he had seen meant, he's, he can't figure it out. And behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house, and they stood before the gate downstairs. And they called, and they asked whether Simon, whose surname uh, was Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. So that's a word of wisdom. That's a spiritual gift. He gives Peter uh, a, a piece of, uh, or, or word of knowledge rather, a piece of knowledge he could not otherwise possess. They're downstairs and they're, uh, they're waiting for you. And then a word of wisdom, what to do with that knowledge that they're down there seeking you. Arise therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have uh, sent them. So God, God is so patient as he teaches us things. So Peter comes, becomes a Christian out of this very unique background that, that he came out of. But every one of us came out of a unique background before we became a Christian, where we've been indoctrinated to look at things a certain way and to view things in a certain way, things that we think are always right or always wrong, and they don't line up with how God sees that, and God is just faithful to just slowly uh, walk us out of it. And so uh, it, it, here the Lord is speaking to him, telling him it's going to be okay. Peter went down to the men uh, who had uh, sent uh, been sent to him from Cornelius, and he said, Yes, I am him whom ye seek, and uh, for what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, one who fears God, has a good reputation among the nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you uh, to his house and to hear words from you. I wonder what those words could be. They want you to come here and, and you're going to speak to, to uh, Cornelius. An angel said you would, and we've come uh, to ask you to come. And so then Peter, he invited them in, and they lodged overnight in that house. And on the next day, Peter went away with them, and some of the brethren, Jewish brethren from Joppa, uh, accompanied Peter. So he doesn't know what's happening here, but apparently he wants Jewish witnesses uh, to whatever, whatever it is that's, uh, uh, that he's getting in the middle of here. And actually, he's going to get called on the carpet for what happens here in chapter 11. And, and so we'll see that, uh, that he had suspicions, but he's wise in doing that. And so the following day, they then entered into the city of Caesarea. Now, Cornelius was waiting for them and uh, had called together his relatives and close friends. So this is extraordinarily a busy man with tremendous responsibilities, and he is waiting in his house, and he's filled his whole house with family members and with friends to hear what this Peter is going to come and preach to them, make known to them uh, from, from God. Such a beautiful... I mean, the... the the eagerness that he possesses in his life spiritually is so attractive. 
And, uh, and there they are gathered together in the house. And as Peter was coming in, walking into the house, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. Of course, completely ill-advised uh, in terms of what he does. But again, this is the excitement. He doesn't understand. All he knows is that he loves God and he wants everything that God has for him. And, you, and he told me to send for you and you came. Thank you for coming. And, and uh, he's so uh, uh, grateful for it, and, and he worships him. Peter, of course, is very, very uh, uncomfortable with this. And uh, he lifted, lifted him up from the ground saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. He would not accept uh, any worship at all of him. And if you've ever had, this is so gracious of Peter, if you have ever been in the shoes of Cornelius, here he is, a prominent in his vocation, how he spends his life. His whole house is full of family members and, uh, and, and friends, and he makes this faux pas right in front of all of them. And Peter knows that it's, it's wrong and a chance to, um, rather than make a big deal out of it, what Peter does here is he kind of redeems the situation and he allows him to save face. He's made a mistake. He glosses it over. He moves very quickly uh, beyond that. And I don't know if you've ever had uh, wise and um, spiritual men and women where you've done something that was, you know, very ill-advised or whatever in some kind of a setting, and then they rescue us. Uh, it is a, that is pure class when they do that. And so often we don't realize that they've done it in the moment, but then we realize later and we're thankful for it. Stand up, I myself am also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and he found many who had come together. And then he said to them, uh, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man, Peter says this to all the Gentiles there and to Cornelius, uh, to keep company with or to go to one of another nation, that is a Gentile. The law of Moses did not teach that the Jews were not to have contact with a Gentile or come into their house. Uh, that became a tradition of the Jews. But it was so driven into their lives uh, that Peter makes known to him, you know this is highly unusual for a Jew to walk into a Gentile's house this, uh, this way, uh, but God has shown me, and that's the reason I'm here, that I should not call any man common or unclean. There's no home of anyone that wants to know about God. No life of anyone who wants to know about God that is uh, so unclean that we don't engage them, whatever the traditions of the culture, whatever, engage them and bring them uh, that message. And so we see somewhere between that rooftop experience and then standing in that room, he got the meaning of those animals being dropped before him, unclean animals, on that uh, sheet. And therefore, I came without objection. As soon as I was sent for, uh, I asked them, for what reason have you sent for me? <laughs> Oh, Peter. They, at the end of verse 22, they let him know an angel told Cornelius to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. And then Peter comes here and he is, this is, he's, he's walking through kind of a, a cultural minefield 
in, in all of this. And rather than saying, this is so obvious what I'm here for is to preach the gospel to you and to be saved, uh, he, uh, he, he stops short of it and says, okay, uh, specifically then, what reason have you sent for me? And Cornelius said, we need the winning numbers to the lottery. That's why you're here. That's why we called for you. Of course, it's in order that we might uh, hear the gospel. You have a message uh, that, that we desperately need to hear. And Peter's going, what might that message uh, be? He knew full well, but he's, he's, I love it. He's working through so much right on the uh, on, the, on the spot, and Cornelius said, four days ago, I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms are remembered and uh, in the sight of God. And send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. And so I sent to you immediately, and you have done well to come. And now therefore we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. He punts it in, 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 uh, toward uh, Peter. I don't know. You're the one that's supposed to know what we need to hear uh, here. I'll just tell you how you got here and why we called, uh, called for you in, in all of this. And then Peter, he opened his mouth, and of course he understood exactly what, it, uh, what he needed to do here. He opened his mouth and he said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. He wants everybody to be saved, Jew and Gentile. But in every nation, every, uh, in every nation, whoever fears Him, uh, has a, a reverence for God, works righteousness, and, and uh, has a, a, a life of endeavoring to discover God and grow close to God, is accepted uh, by Him. And not for salvation uh, based on works, but accepted by Him as someone that's seeking Him and He's going to give greater revelation to. And the Word of God, set, uh, the Word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, He is Lord of all. And that Word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea, and began from uh, Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And so he uh, brings uh, Cornelius and his household up to date on the life and the ministry uh, of Jesus during the three and a half years of his public ministry from the time of his water baptism with John the Baptist uh, until uh, his uh, death, burial, and resurrection. And then he declared, and we, speaking of himself and the apostles, are witnesses of all these things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. And now he moves in this sermon that he's preaching now, he's preaching a sermon, talking about Jesus, talking about his ministry, and now he comes to the central part of it. He preaches the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you never find uh, uh, the, uh, those three uh, preached independent of one another in the book of Acts. It takes all three to provide us with the victory uh, over our fallen condition, death, burial, and resurrection. So uh, what he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, who they killed by hanging on a tree, a cross. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him uh, openly, and that is as a witness to God's, uh, God's amen to Jesus' it is finished on the cross. It was God's way of saying, confirming his, his life and his teaching. God raised him up on the third day, showed him openly, not to all people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him 
after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to uh, the people and to testify, uh, Jesus did, that he, uh, it is he who was ordained by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. And that everyone will be judged one day uh, on the basis of what it is that they've done uh, with Christ, with his offer of salvation. Uh, that is founded upon this death, burial, and resurrection, three greatest events in, in human uh, history. And to him, that is Jesus, all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him should, re should receive uh, remission of sins. And so Peter here, he assumes in Cornelius some knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures because he speaks about uh, the, the Old Testament prophets. And he said, just as the prophets declared concerning the Messiah, that salvation would uh, be brought to mankind, not on the basis of works and human effort, but on the basis of putting faith in Him, in Jesus, this Savior, for the remission of sins. And while Peter was still speaking these words, I like that word still right there, He's still speaking. He's right in the middle of the sermon. And God interrupts it. It kind of reminds me of that old story about uh, D.L. Moody where he was, uh, there was somebody, and Peter's not in this category, but uh, they had this big evangelistic campaign and so they turn over to the different prominent pastors in the community to, to, you know, make the announcements one would do and then one would open up in prayer and the guy that was opening up in prayer thought this was his moment to shine and he's droning on and on and on in his prayer and he's praying to himself basically and uh, D.L. Moody realized he's killing the meeting and so he stood up and he said, well, while our brother is finishing his prayer, uh, let's continue on with the meeting <laughs> and so he just kind of disregarded it. And, and continued. Peter was still uh, preaching these words. I mean, he had two more points to the sermon. And the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. They were born again. Why did the Holy Spirit fall upon them in that moment, except that everyone in that room was listening and tracking? and hanging on every word that Peter was preaching and then acknowledging it and making that truth their own. And when he came to the part in which he said, salvation as the prophets taught is, is found in faith in this Messiah, at that moment they were doing it in their hearts. And so they're born again. In, in that moment, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as they hear the word, they're born again. And those of the circumcision uh, who were Christians, they were astonished at this, as many as came with Peter from Joppa, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. So they're thinking, oh, we're in trouble. We are in big, big trouble with all of the... Uh, heads of things back in Jerusalem. They're going to want an accounting uh, of this, and they will. And that's what the next chapter is all about. But their minds are being blown at the, the, at the fact, again, they're in this insulated thing that God cares uh, uh, supremely and maybe only for the Jews in the world. And He cares nothing about the Gentiles. And all of this is being turned on its head uh, in their witnesses of it as the Holy Spirit comes upon this entire room uh, of, of Gentiles. And for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify uh, God. And then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized to have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? He said, Peter said, All right, I'm going all the way with what God is doing here. These are Gentiles, they are born again, and, uh, and uh, they are qualified to be water baptized. Let's take care of it. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. 
And then they asked him to stay for a few days, which he did in order now to further explain beyond one uh, uh, interrupted sermon about the things of the Lord and the Christian life and to begin to disciple them. And so this beautiful uh, passage, it's oftentimes called the, the Gentile Day of Pentecost is what happened there in that, in that room as the gospel comes here. And, and, and this is what makes this chapter so significant. The first time that the gospel comes uh, to uh, the Gentiles just as Gentiles. And so it's the birth of, of the Gentile portion uh, of the church. And so this monumental thing that happened in history and uh, me being uh, half Scot and half Irish and thus uh, uh, fully Gentile, um, this is, uh, this is uh, our, my spiritual heritage. Yours does. It goes all the way back uh, to here and, uh, and, and the the Gentiles now being reached with the gospel, and the rest is history, uh, as they uh, say. Beautiful passage, and it certainly teaches us, I think, is um, it teaches us concerning our own um, prejudices that we grow up with or are ingrained in us, whether by a family um, or by you know, podcasts that we tap into or entertainment or um, education or, or whatever it might be. And, um, and, and, and the tendency uh, to look at a certain group of people as being uh, beyond uh, the reach of God or beyond uh, God caring about them and wanting every single person in this world uh, to be saved and to realize that He loves every unsafe person in this world as much as He loves us and desires them to be saved as much as He desires uh, us to be saved and to not lose sight of the world, something the Lord never loses sight of, the great harvest field uh, that it is. Nobody is beyond not just the reach of God, but it's beyond God's desire uh, to save. Let's stand together and we'll close in prayer. Thank you, Father, for all of the, I mean, the big, big thing here of getting Peter and the early church and the leaders in the early church to see your heart for the whole world. And we pray that for our own lives as well. But then all of these little nuances and these little things, and we see how gentle Peter was with Cornelius, but we see even more how gentle you were um, with Peter and bringing him along so that his heart and his mind would reflect yours. And we thank you for how far you've brought each of us in that regard in our walk with you. And we ask that you would continue to do that, continue to develop your heart within, within us, and specifically here tonight, your heart toward all of the people around us uh, that are going to be saved but are not yet saved. And the evidence being that we are still here and you haven't raptured us all out of here. Thank you for the gospel that changed our lives. Thank you for the privilege, Lord, of being able to carry it. Thank you for people, despite how many reject it today, are still waiting to hear. Use us, Lord, in that mission field, in that harvest field this week, we pray. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.